Bird, 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 bird! Round Babe was right. Round Babe was right. I'm feeling, I'm feeling spry. Okay, if for any reason you are still living under a rock and you still don't have Onyx Hunt on your phone or on your dashboard or on your iPad. I don't know why. I mean, if you're waiting for the promo code, which you can get in a box of Cheerios, it's HDP20. 20% off the Elite Series. You'll be able to navigate your way to bird heaven this year. And from what I've been told, it might be bird heaven this year. Um, and they, of course, they're the title sponsor of this show. They're title sponsor of every one of my hunts. I don't go anywhere without it. I've been mapping out the back of my property after our logging project with trails, and I can keep going right up to my neighbor's edge with my trails. I'm making them for the grandkids. I'm, I'm going to be that indulgent grandpa. I'm going to get a golf cart. We're going to go bopping around the trails. We look for dinosaurs that don't exist. It's corny. But you know what's not corny? Onyx Hunt. That's not corny. And you know everything else that this podcast is brought to you by. Gunner Kennels, W Supply, Garmin, Canine Athlete, Mossberg, Boss Shot Shells, Purina Pro Plan, Waltons, Marshware, Four Wheel Camper, Arxis Boots, that's Arxis, A-R-X-U-S. I spell it because I spelled it wrong originally when I, I, I did it the first time. So it's A-R-X-U-S for the rubber boots that you know you came to love with gum leaf. You will come to love even more with Arxis. So I also have to make an announcement. Uh, Zero Breeze is, is not a sponsor of the show. We're just doing a promotion for, for a little bit here yet while the warm weather exists. They sent me their Mark II portable air conditioner, which is now in the back of my Model M camper, which I made these custom vents in the window, and it is cool. But what I forgot to tell you is when you go to their website, if you go there, you can find the discount code... They didn't give it to me, but you can find it on their website for a free travel carry case. Like, to get, I never use, well, I shouldn't say that. I use my Arxis boot bag. I do, I do use that. But I don't use the, you know, my, my, that air conditioner is, is going to sit in that truck until I put it in the, in the kennel building. But you can get a free carry bag. Like, just to, some people love to keep stuff in bags and zip them up and, Keep them shiny. I, I I didn't tell them that, you know. Most of my sponsors know that I'm kind of like a shanty Irishman. And I've already nicked up my Mossberg shotguns. I've, I've, I've spilled... I, I, oh, shit. I've lost one of my Garmin transmitters the other day. Um, I need collars for my dog, and I didn't even call W Supply like a dummy, you know. I got my Gunner food crates... Yeah, I got all. I'm I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I just want to make sure you knew that about arcs or <laughs> about zero breeze. Okay, the portable air conditioner that will keep your dogs comfy, whether it's spring, summer, anytime it's hot out. If you think there's an issue, you got you got zero breeze on your side. So check that out. Your dog's comfort is worth it. My comfort's worth it. I mean, I use air conditioning, and I don't know about you, but my truck has air conditioning. I think the last 15 trucks I had had air conditioning. I use it every time it's uncomfortable. So I spoil my dogs like I spoil my grandkids. And you know, that's all. So this episode, um, I hope I hope it, you know, we're only, this podcast obviously goes all over the damn world like all podcasts do. You get two, two, two downloads in Russia and three in China and 17 in Germany and 18 here. But... If you're anywhere near Michigan and you want to learn about grouse hunting, grouse habitat, guns, veterinary care, this episode, you're even going to just learn some stuff from the episode. We had Dr. Scott Smith and Blake Renfro on from the RGS chapter here in Michigan. We cover a little bit about hunting. We cover a little bit about our trips. But we do get into some really good stuff with Scott about uh, tick-borne disease. It's crazy. This, this world's going crazy. With ticks. And uh, so you're going to learn about that today. But if you come to the RGS event 
at the Gladwin Field Trial Grounds, you will have the entire day to bend Scott's ear or Del Whitman's ear about guns or a host of people about cook Joe Swanky for if you if you want to become a chef, besides that you could use like all the Walton stuff, that's not gonna teach you how to cook. It's gonna give you the implements to cook. Anyway, I, I tried not to ramble. It's only four and a half minutes because I want to get this out. I gotta get going. Um, I love you guys, I love you girls, and I love you RGS members even more. All right, everybody, this one's really important, and it's going to come out the middle of this week right here, Thursday or Thursday night, because there's an event going on um, with a person I've made friends with over the last couple of years, Blake Renfro. I got it right, right? Renfro. Yep. And he is, I don't know if you want to say a kindred spirit with me, but we're both dumb enough to own uh, wire-haired visualas and... He's dumb enough to go down the path I went through years ago. He has also has a draw tire. And yeah. along with this is uh, Dr. Scott Smith. And both of these guys are going to be an event coming up. So Blake or Scott, take off the lead here, and then we'll get into all the, the nitty-gritty. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so, yeah, the event that we're doing is uh, kind of a Michigan Rough Grouse kickoff our season kickoff an event. Um, so what we're doing is going to just have a fun weekend on the opener. Um, we're going to have a panel of people come out um, to speak and uh, can have some prizes, some food. Um, and then the, the big importance of this too is the two aspects are um, Scott and I are both starting up the uh, gym foot chapter of RGS again. Um, I don't know, I think 2019 or so is when that kind of fizzled out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, so, yeah. That's right. They had that that sporting clay shoot up at Lewiston in mm -hmm. uh, kind of in like August of 2019. I think that's the last thing they did. And then I'm sure COVID didn't help of anything getting resurgence. So there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So uh, Gabe Stone from RGS uh, got with us and kind of thought it'd be cool to have us have an event before the season started. And then uh, also this year is going to be the 10 year anniversary of AWS American Woodcock society, as well as the 10 year anniversary of the gems in Michigan, which is the grouse enhanced management sites. So now Blake, is this going to be like, are you doing it similar to what we did? Or I, I was up at uh, one up in Wisconsin a, a few years ago. Is it educational? There's going to be what what all is going to be there, and how do people you know like do they have to sign up? Yeah, time or can they just show up? Yeah, so it's going to be fifty dollars uh, entry fee um, for everybody, and so we're going to have a. It's going to be educational. So Scott is going to be there um, talking about, um, I guess, just dog field care and um, other. I'll let, I'll let him speak to that later on, I but, bet. um, right. and then, uh, we've got like a taxidermist coming. That's going to be just talking about how to handle your birds. If you want to get them taxidermy afterwards, um, we're going to have a habitat walk with, uh, some members from the DNR that are going to be able to show us, um, and be able to like feel, touch, see, uh, kind of what, what you would want to look for when you're out in the field and just the different types of work that forest, the forestry department does here. Um, I know I'm missing some, some people as well. Scott, do you? <laughs> we've got, we've got, uh, Del Whitman is going to come yep. and, um, you know, he normally does a lot of uh, shotgun, you know, fitting stuff, but we wanted to keep it a little more accessible. Not everybody's going to have you know, a shotgun that's going to be, you know, customizable or, or go out and restock their gun. So he's right. going to come and he's going to talk about patterning uh, your shotgun and then and then also firearm care, um, you know, take care of these guns. You know, how far do you need to go every day? You know, deep cleaning, th those kind of things. Um, you know, he's, he's going to get into it. I, I think Gabe is going to talk a little bit at lunch about all of the projects um, that, that Rough Grouse Society has their has their their foot in right now in Michigan. I yeah. was I was I was kind of dumbfounded by just how much they have going on habitat wise. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy good for for yeah. once. Yeah. Um, could we? Is Dell going to be there the whole day or just for a few hours? Do you know what his plans are? 
I, I, I don't know. Okay. Cause I would tell people, I mean, Dell's a heck of a nice guy. I've known him for years. I had him on the podcast probably six years ago. I went up to his shop and I've had him on again. And I would tell, I, I, I don't want to tell listeners, I don't want to speak out of turn for the event, but if you've got a shotgun, I, and I, and I know people that can do this and I know Dell's one of them. He's not going to have the time to fit you a gun and give you dimensions. That's going to take a long time. But if you have a gun, let's say an old gun or a gun you like, I, I'm not shooting this gun good. I'll bet you with him, if you mount the gun and, you know, they'll put a, a safety flag in the chamber. I, I've seen guys like Dell be able to kind of like, oh, you know what? Just a little length of pull. You'll be good. Or a little this or a, a cheek pad. I'm going to speak for Dell and tell people, bring your guns. I don't know if you'll all get a chance to have Dell work with you hand in hand, but boy, if you're already there, I would, I would bet Dell would give him a hand with it. Yeah. I think the, uh, the idea for the event too, is we're trying to catch people on their way up to grouse camp or if they're already there, something to do. Cause it's on a Saturday, the opener is on a Sunday. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, we're going to go from like 10 in the morning till, I don't know, three, four o'clock, mm -hmm. I believe. So, and the idea is going to have people that want to hang out or that can hang out afterwards. So hopefully, yeah, we might have some downtime to where you could. Yeah. Or any of the people on the panel that are going to be there to just actually talk to them and now, you know, ask questions. There's, there's going to be camping that night, right? There's going to be, we're going to have a, I'm going to host a trivia game. I have, I've got a, a box full of prizes from Purina that they sent me. Um, so we'll have a trivia game. We'll record that. It might sound like mayhem for a recording. <laughs> uh, we're, it's going to be, like you said, it's it's kind of like uh, Christmas Eve instead of Christmas Day. The opener Sunday, and this is like the primer for it. And, when, and especially if someone's, you know, and I get enough emails, I, I, I should have probably just saved them in the file of the newbie file. Wanting to either just a little camaraderie, maybe just a gun question, maybe just a habitat part of it, or maybe just coming up and asking... Uh, Dr. Smith, nobody ever calls a vet Dr. Smith. You know, they always, call, they always, I always called my vets by their first name, but my doctor, I always call him doctor. I don't know why, but <laughs> Dr. Smith will be there. And I'm sure you're open to some questions above and beyond your, what you're going to speak on probably, I would think, huh, Scott? Oh, absolutely. We, and, and the, the whole idea for this is not, it's not original. We kind of stole it. Kevin, Kevin Stewart, and I can't remember the name of his chapter right now. They've done a similar event the last two years mm -hmm. there at Alibi Hall earlier in the year in like August, uh, but yeah. the same kind of thing. And I spoke last year and, and uh, had this nice presentation I put together on on uh, injury prevention, uh, mm -hmm. going all the way back to, you know, choosing a, choosing a dog from good bloodlines all the way through. And I think I got maybe a third or, or half the way through the presentation before it just digressed into a big question and answer session. Right. Uh, which is, yeah. which is, which is great because I, you know, I don't necessarily know what everybody wants to hear. So I, I, I love it when it kind of breaks down that way. Right. Right. I, I'm famous for that. I, I went to one that Purina put on in St. Louis and it, and it always takes a while. Like you said, the presenters talking, if you have any questions and one hand goes up and as soon as they know they can go a little in a rabbit hole, like, Hey, what about my dog's toenails? Can I, <laughs> they, yeah. it goes everywhere, but it's, I mean, that's what we do at grouse camp, wherever we go, bird camp. You know, we 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 tailgate doctor our dogs, and it's nice, you know, if unless you have a really, really good relationship or if you're new to this, I don't want to say it's hard to get to know your vet, but you only get to see the vet for so long. Yeah. And, you know, you're in there for an appointment. Yeah, a few extra minutes once in a while. But, I mean, to me, that's that's worth the price of admission to sit around and, and, and talk uh, crucial ligament problems. <laughs> <laughs> and fat, yeah, and fat dogs. <laughs> yeah, de definitely. You know, it's funny. L last year, the biggest question I got, and I had just person after person after person ask about this, was how do I get my vet to quit telling me my dog is too skinny? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I put a picture up on Instagram about two months ago of a dog I inherited, and the comments were like, how about feeding it first? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God forbid its last two ribs were showing, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I don't think we said this. This is, I mean, first of all, we're going to do it again at the end, but Blake, how do people sign up for this? Yeah. So it's on the Rough Grouse Society website. I don't know the exact URL, but just the, the national RGS website. And if you go to the events page, 
Just so. go to the events page and you'll find it. Okay. Yeah. Or or if you are a member and you're on the email chain, I I don't know if it who the uh email blast got sent out to, but it should also be um at least I got it. I don't know if it's just a Michigan thing that they sent it out to, but it should be in your email too. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the link is on our chapter Facebook page as well. And I know yeah. a, a ton of people have reposted the link already out there, Good. Um, you know, on, on their pages too. And this is going to be at the Gladwin Field Trial Grounds, which are not impossible to find, but I would tell people don't, don't get frustrated, you know, frustrated if you miss the turn, because I did. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little, but it, it's, it's very findable. And, uh, I mean, we'll reiterate, it's not grouse season, but there is no shooting a grouse on this field trial grounds because it's used for, it's one of the, I think only two or three or four places in the country where they can hold these field trials and have enough numbers of grouse to, uh, for the dogs to be judged. So it's a pretty special place. Um, what about the food? What are we, what are they doing for food for, is it lunch and dinner or lunch and bring your own dinner if you stay? What What's the idea there, Blake? Uh, yeah, so it's lunch and dinner. Um, the lunch is going to be, I think we're just doing Subway sandwiches, um, mm -hmm. catering that. And then for dinner, I'm actually going to be smoking a couple pork shoulders. So Nice. Yep. Uh, any, anything special from uh, Mr. Swanky? He sometimes shows up at these things. He he is going to be there. He's going to be, he's on the roster to do a demo for uh, just like an Upland Bird type of uh, yeah. just recipe. So Cool. So for anybody who likes cooking, hunting, dogs, guns, I mean, it's got everything there. And it's got the same reason I hunt. I, I've told people for years, probably because I'm getting old, but I don't care if I get birds. I always want to get birds. Don't get me wrong. But as long as I got friends to talk to at the end of the day, it, it that's a hunting trip. This, this is no more than a hunting trip. It's not going to rain, but just pretend it was a rain out and you just had to sit around all day. Talk grouse, talk habitat, talk veterinary care, talk shotguns, talk cooking. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, it should be fun. I mean, that was that was half the reason why um, I reached out to Gabe. So, yeah, the story behind us restarting the uh, the Jim Foot RGS chapter up here, which is based out of Gaylord, but we're trying to we're ta we're using Gaylord and Grayling kind of as where we host our events um, yeah. for the most part. But yeah, I mean, that was, I'm, I'm a social guy and, you know, that was, that was half the reason I wanted to get right the chapter going again was to, I guess, hang out with more like-minded people like myself up here. So Scott, were you a member of the gym foot or is this a new, did you get hauled into this by, uh, by your shirt tails? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm a member of the, the, the new gym foot chapter here. Um, I've not done much with rough grass society it, you know, it's kind of interesting. I've, I've, I've hunted rough grouse in five states now, and I think mm -hmm. this is part of what drives me. I've hunted them in five states. Only two of those states even have an open season now. And, oh. and one of those states is Kentucky, and you know how their bird numbers are. You know? Right. right. So no, it, it's, no, no one's taken I-65 south to go grouse. No, no they're, they're not. When I was in, when I went to vet school at, at University of Missouri, and we actually had an open rough grouse season in Missouri at that point, you know, and it wasn't flushes per hour. It was flushes per day. You know, you were counting yeah. out there, but they still had a season. And I was involved with RGS out there and on the banquet committee and stuff when I was in school. And then, you know, life and work and everything, I just got too busy to be involved. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of getting to a stage, Hey, I want to get back involved in this. You know, this chapter needs to be going. We've got so many chapters that are kind of for one reason or another, you know, the, the old timers are getting tired of doing it. It's, it's oh. like any volunteer organization. And it's like, I, I want to see this get going. We're kind of right here in the heart of where so many people come to, right. to hunt rough grouse and woodcock. We need to have, have the organization going. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I, I noticed our chapter here in Muskegon, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't call it, it's not inactive. It's, it's got a banquet every year, but we're not seeing any growth to speak of. And, and, and sometimes you know, having like the, the brew nights and the get together like this kind of gets you fired up. You might find one more volunteer, you know, that one new person's like, Oh, I, I didn't know you guys were that cool. You know, let, you know, there's always, there's always, now I will say it's probably bring your own alcohol, right? 
<laughs> it's not you're not supplying beer, beer, wine, and, and mixed drinks, <clears throat> are you? Okay. Uh yeah, I don't I don't think so. Okay. My truck usually has a good supply in it, but I can't take care of the whole place. So <laughs> if I'd have got down to Watermark Brewery, I, I think he would have donated some for it, but I, I couldn't get down there in time. Um J or Scott, tell me a little bit when you said uh hunting in Missouri, is that what does it look like compared to Michigan? I, I mean, I mean I've drove through a piece of Missouri. All right, is it same, same? Is it half mountainous? Is it what's it kinda, like? Kind of the habitat. I, I mean, at that point we had rough grouse still kind of in in, in central, kind of the, the Missouri River breaks. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you'd you'd go up some of the some of the draws and some of the valleys with some of the tributaries of the, the Missouri there. And that's where you were finding birds. Um, you know, a lot of the, you know, typically you looked for slopes, you looked for woody stem density, um, you know, and you'd get into birds. But I mean, definitely, you know, we didn't have the cold weathers, you know, in the winters like we do up here, of course. Yeah. Don't have cold weather in the winter up here anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> it uh, so it was it was kind of a it was it was a, it was different. I mean, generally very steep, rugged, you know, a lot of climbing up and down kind of things. It sounds like the stuff I did. I occasionally do at my place in Virginia when we hunt the George Washington National Forest mm -hmm. I stick to the trails because if you get off trail all of a sudden it gets you could go down a couple hundred feet you ain't getting up unless you go up another side you know mm -hmm. if, if god forbid my dog went down there I had to disappoint him but uh that's one of the things I love about Michigan I mean grouse hunting can be uh you know sticks in the face and briars and everything else but there's just no hills and I just love it. I just mm -hmm. love it at my age. Blake, have you, uh, have you chased the birds around other, other States yet? Or are you a uh, Michigan, uh, Michigan bound grouse hunter? No, we, uh, we traveled a little bit. Um, not for rough grouse, but yeah, I mean, we, every year we hood up North Dakota. Um, we've got a spot, some friends down in Illinois, for pheasants that we'll do later later on in the season um this year i want to expand and i don't know i was kind of on the radar i've got i got a buddy that lives out there now so i might at least go over there and sleep on his couch <laughs> yeah you you're known for that you did that you did that a few weeks ago when i ran into you You were going to sleep on somebody else's couch yep yep <laughs> and scott you know you're going to cover i'm sure you've got an itinerary of things to cover but I'd love you to touch a little bit about the, the, before we hit record about the, the ticks and the, the Lyme disease, what's kind of going on. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're seeing, you know, this part of Michigan where we're at, we didn't have, I moved up here 21 years ago now. Mm -hmm. We didn't have ticks here. There, there just weren't ticks. We didn't talk, you know, we would talk about Lyme vaccine uh, and, and tick control to, you know, our, our, our hunting clients that were going to the UP or Wisconsin and, stuff yeah. like that, but we didn't worry about it locally. And probably in the last 10, 12 years, our tick numbers have just steadily climbed. And then the, the tick vector diseases have spread along behind it. Right. Um, I mean, here in our office, I've died. Lyme disease, of course, is the biggie. We've diagnosed ehrlichiosis in dogs. We've diagnosed dogs positive an anaplasmosis. Um, a couple of years ago, and I was not smart enough to figure this out, this dog went to two different specialists before they got it narrowed down, had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Had never left Iosco County, Michigan wow. until it went downstate to see internists. So somehow this dog got infected with RMSF in, in Iosco County. Um, so it's 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 an issue and it's a problem, um, you know. And it, it's I, I try and preach multimodal control. I like to see these dogs vaccinated for Lyme disease, and I like to see good quality uh, tick prevention on board too. Right. Do you, do you prefer a collar or do you prefer like a, a drop in the, you know, down the back or is, is there a, is there one I, over I, the other? I like the oral products. The oral products okay. definitely got the most effective and the fastest speed of kill. And in fact, most of them, if not all of them are actually labeled for the prevention of Lyme disease. Now they're, they're, they're oh. their control is good enough that the FDA says this tick prevention will keep you from getting Lyme disease. Wow. So what does it look like? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I, I'm trying to think it's been, you know, 35 years of dogs. And like you said, when I moved to Michigan, that was 35 years ago. We never had a tick in our backyard. I never got a tick in the woods. You know, I hunted mostly the 
mid to Southern Michigan to, you know, Muskegon County up to Baldwin and, you know, a, a little further North, maybe even Gaylord. Um, yeah. I, we never had a tick, never pulled a tick off a dog. And uh, what does that, what does that look like for a person? Like if you didn't even know the dog had the tick and that right. tick passed it, what are the signs or symptoms like that for people yeah. to look for? And, and the, a lot of the ticks, you know, ex, the Ixodes ticks are the ones that spread Lyme disease. The, the, the immature life stage, and, and every life stage can transmit it, but the mm -hmm. immature life stage of the Ixodes tick is, is, is very, very dark brown, almost black, and it is smaller than a poppy seed. Okay. And they have a propensity to get like in between toes and stuff. So you're not going to know that tick that infected your dog was there. Even when you do a tailgate exam, you're probably going to miss that for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and fortunately, when we have dogs come in, you know, the, the, the heartworm test we use today also screens for Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, and anaplasmosis. Okay. And pretty much all of them do. So I'm catching the majority of the cases on that screening test before they're clinical. Wow. Um, which is good. And then there's some confirmatory testing. You do a titer and, and see where they're at and all, all this stuff. The dogs I'm seeing that come in clinical, um, you get two kind of big conditions in dogs with Lyme disease. You, you get a, a what's called a non-erosive polyarthropathy. So it, it doesn't cause erosion of the joint cartilage, but you get multiple inflamed joints. Okay. Um, I, I remember one dog that came in, um, came in, presented for a, a left front lameness. And the owners thought the leg was swollen. And I looked at the dog in the room and yeah, sure enough, the left carpus was swollen and hot and, and kind of looking at the history with the dog and everything. I, you know, I said, Hey, let's, let's take this dog out and let's, you know, trot him up and down the hall. Let me watch how he moves. And yeah, he was lame on his left front foot. And I looked at the dog. I said, this dog hurts everywhere. So I said, before I, you know, spend several hundred dollars shooting a bunch of x-rays, I said, let me do a 4 DX. And sure enough, the, the dog came up positive. We did a titer. It had a titer of like 600 and something. Um, they had two other dogs. Um, one of their two other dogs was asymptomatic, but it was positive. The third dog didn't have it. Um, wow. So, so I, I've seen a lot of those. I, I had a dog come in that, that looked like a, uh, an ACL dog. Okay. And, and it had, you know, had obviously had some ACL pathology and even did an x-ray of the stifle. And yeah, it looks like an old ACL injury. But just something about it I didn't like. And I said, let's screen this dog for Lyme disease. And it, yeah, it had ACL pathology, but it had Lyme disease. Wow. Um, and the other thing is this, they get a Lyme nephritis, which is inflammation of the nephrons in the kidney. Um, these dogs come in, they, they look like they've got a bladder infection. They're, they're peeing in the house or they're, they're, they're having accidents or, you know, peeing, go outside to pee and they pee six times. Like it looks like a dog with a bladder infection or bladder stones or what have you. Yeah. Except then you do your analysis and there's inflammation, but there's no bacteria, there's no crystals, none of that stuff. Uh, and those dogs end up having Lyme disease as well. And if that goes on too long, then they go into kidney failure. Oh, wow. So that that's a whole different path that could go down. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, that's funny you say that. Um, well, we, we, we haven't met, but Blake's met some of my dogs and I have a a breed called Brocco Italiano, not real popular, but enough people have seen a few of them here and there. And, and, uh, a lot of people have said, Oh, they're, they're prone to kidney disease. And like, so there's a, there's something else that could kill a dog. That's not actually a hereditary kidney disease. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's from a tick from a damn tick. Mm -hmm. If the dogs are vaccinated and, and you mentioned oral, um, is, is that a, a dual thing you do? You vaccinate once a year, but you give a a, a, a pill. Yeah, to? yeah, you do that. the The oral product is is to is for ticks. It's to control okay. the ticks and well, and fleas too. Right. Um, and you know, there's there's several of them out there. There's there's Brevecto. There's Nexgard. There's Credelio. Right. Uh, some Parica. There's there's several of them out there, and they all work good. And and does that. So explain the vaccine part then. How does the vac does the vaccine do something different than the pill? Well, the, the, the pill is just to control the tick. Oh, okay. It's just to control the tick, uh, which you want to do because there's other tick vector diseases than just Lyme. Right. The vaccine actually is, is like a vaccine, any other vaccine. It's it's the vaccine is against Borrelia burgdorferi. 
which is the, the, the organism that causes Lyme disease. Okay. It's like you might take a vaccine against lepto or distemper or parvo or whatever. Right, right. I got gotcha. you. Um, Blake, have you had any problems with this so far living in Michigan? Um, I mean, I, I do what Scott has said to do. I mean, I, we do the Lyme vaccine and we also do Cordelio. So, but I mean, where I'm at, I don't, you might find a handful, like if we hunt, if I hunt hard, like every day in a week, like earlier in the season, I might find a couple. It's not terrible, but earlier this spring though, when I was doing some woodcock banding or I was going through like the mentorship for that. Um, yeah, it was terrible. Like I, I went over to the east side of the state and yeah, I probably picked 25, 30 after just one run. Wow. But the nice thing about Cordelio, I mean, if they do end up biting the dog, it just, they shrivel up and fall off. So, but the other risk you run is for my dogs are house dogs. So if yeah, you get you a tag along think- in the house. <laughs> right. right. Scott, is there, is there any human crossover? Is it the same Lyme disease that we get as humans from the tick bite? It, it is with, with people though, it, it seems like, you know, and I, I don't know if there's, it's like an autoimmune component to it. Mm-hmm. Or, or a lot of times too, I mean, human physicians are not doing a lot of testing for Lyme disease. Yeah. And, and it, every person I've ever known that got, had Lyme disease, you know, they've gone, they're, they're at about their sixth physician, you know, or out at Mayo Clinic or something before somebody finally figures it out. Right. And, and so they've had it for an extended period of time. Uh, yeah. So it seems like there's a lot more sequelae in people and, and long-term issues than there are in dogs. Right. What is, how long does that take, or I, I would imagine there's data on it from, let's say that tick does bite the dog. The dog's not vaccinated. This tick's carrying the disease. What's the timeline for that? Like, could it, would it be months later, like after hunting season or does it come on pretty quick? Yeah. It's typically going to be months later before they show illness. And then too, it's going to depend on how much of that organism is inoculated into them by the tick. Mm. You know, did they get, did they get bit by one tick one time, you know, or did they have 10 ticks on them that were carrying Borrelia? Right. right. And there's no way to tell, well, you, you can't, when a, when a tick first gets on the dog, like you said, it's the size of a poppy seed. Yeah. There, there, there's, you can't like bring the tick in in a lunch bag and say, can you test this tick for, for Lyme disease? You know? mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I, well, I think experimentally they, they can they, yeah. for DNA in the, in the tick salivary glands. In this case, an uh, ounce of prevention <laughs> is, is worth the pound to cure. Absolutely. What else do you see a lot of? Is that like the biggest thing on the radar or with, with dogs or? Yeah, as far as infectious diseases, it probably is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every year it seems like, I'll, or every year, every couple of years, I'll see a case of, uh, you know, uh, fungal pneumonia, blastomycosis. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's usually hunting dogs because yeah. they, you know, they're, they're sniffing and snorting and you know, inhale those spores. Uh, fortunately, that's not very often, but that and then the trauma. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's one of those things. You can go buy a whole dog's life and have one, not one hurt and you get another one that he's at the vet once a year every season with something stuck in him or, um, and I'm sure you can, you'll be going over some of that kind of field care. At, absolutely, at the, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to kind of touch on, you know, some basic, you know, first aid kit stuff, you know, what, mm-hmm. you know, what do I carry in my kit? What do I try and have on me all the time? you know, realistically, what stuff should you have? I think a lot of people go overboard when they start thinking about first aid kits and stuff. First aid kit is that it's, it's first aid, you know, right. it's there to get you, your dog, your hunting buddy, whoever out of the field and where they can get proper care. Yeah. And I think, you know, it was funny years ago, all of a sudden people started getting staplers from their, their, their vet. Right. And everybody's yeah. going to be a field surgeon, right? They're going to start <laughs> stem like, I had one and I was like, I wouldn't even know how to use the thing. Even if I've watched my vet do it a bunch of times, I'd rather just do whatever you need to do first aid wise, wrap it up, get to the vet. It's a lot of peace of mind. Uh, it, it's a huge peace of mind. I, I would not want to, I know people that have done it and I know bear hunters and houndsmen are kind of famous for it because they, they, nothing stops them. Right. And, uh, but yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave the actual, sutures staples and uh everything else to you guys i i I feel a lot better about it um 
what what percentage your of your clients are in sporting dogs? Would you say? Do you have an idea? You know, it's not going to be very high, to be honest. Probably almost um, like ten percent of hunters. Ten percent of people are hunters, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you divvy them out around. I mean, I see, you know, hunting dogs, sporting dogs. You know, certainly on a daily basis. Yeah, but it but it's not like I'm seeing you know, you know, six or eight of them a day kind of a thing. Right. Do you uh do you feed and care for any of your own? Oh yeah, yeah. I've got English. I've got well, I've got two English setters right now. One's one's fourteen and a half, and she's got terrible cognitive dysfunction. You know, you've got to you've got to watch her. You let her get you get her up and get her out to go to the bathroom, and it's kind of sad to watch. And I deal with this with clients all the time. She'll you know stumble trot out into the yard, and if you don't watch her, she'll just do a U turn and come right back in the house because <laughs> she, she forgets why she's out there. Oh wow! So that one's off the that that one's not going out in the field anymore. No, no, no she's not been out in a long. I I tried to take her out. I think the last time was about three years ago because you kind of feel bad for her. So I'd try and take her out of it, and she was in this mode where she would whatever direction she was going, she just went straight. I mean, like an arrow. <laughs> so you'd have to run and, and she couldn't hear really worth a darn. So you have to run and get ahead of her and wave your arms to to slow her down, but. Uh, uh, but no, then and I, I've got a uh, I've got a three year old setter right now as well. Right, a friend of mine's wife just got a setter, and we were talking about it at our NAVDA training grounds last night. And him and myself and another guy, I've had a lot of European dogs. I've never had a setter. I've never had a proper grouse dog in my life. And I always said, well, I don't, you know, I always want to make sure the dog's going to retrieve. Well, a lot of setters do, a lot of don't. But I mean, I, I've always found reasons not to. And after watching this guy's young pup and some videos he took of it, the other guy, Kyle, said, he goes, I'm getting a specialist next time. I'm getting a grouse dog. I live in Michigan. I'm getting a, he didn't say setter. He says, I'm getting a real grouse dog. So, <laughs> it's, Blake, how far away are you from uh, giving up the ghost on all these European dogs? Are you ready for a good old American English uh, setter? Uh, we've talked about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there might, I might, I don't know. We got three dogs right now, so I don't know. In a couple of years, maybe I'll just show up with one, <laughs> but I, I told myself, I can't call myself a grouse hunter if I, if I don't get one. Yeah. yeah Blake so. and I were comparing uh porcupine encounter pictures the other night too. And uh, oh yeah. <laughs> I, and yeah. I, so I, my, my, my wire hair, like he, well, yeah, he is insane um yeah he got a face fully dispatched one pretty much behind the house so he had a face full i think i don't know the vets didn't even count she said we just wanted we just started ripping them out so i was like that yeah, yeah probably 300 <laughs> that's what she guessed or more i i couldn't tell you how many my vet i was on a trip i had this one dog that would always jump the fence and another dog saw her do it and figured out how to go with her and he was never a runaway dog. She was always running away. She came back with about, I don't know, 15, 20 quills, just, you know, from poking, I'm guessing at the dead carcass probably, right? He came back. I'm sure, Scott, you've seen him all the way down the throat, everything but the eyeballs. I don't know how, I don't know how that happens, thank God, but everything. And my vet, Tiffany, um, I I think she said four or five hundred quills. I I don't know if that's even wow. possible. She said, and and she loves kind of you know busting busting on me a little bit. She goes, I don't know about this Italian dog, Ron. This is the first time I have pulled test of quills out of a dog's sheath and testicles. <laughs> because wow, but I can tell your dog either unfortunately raked right over it and then went back to go kill it. Or killed it and humped it. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I can't, I can't prove the order in which they punctured, but it was, <laughs> and my wife had to take it to the vet and, oh my God. So yeah, setters are not known for that. that that's no, my, my, my dog's entire porcupine experience. Um, he was when he was, I think a year and a half old and I was looking at some bear sign and he was kind of up a ridge a little bit and some, some popple slashings. And all of a sudden I hear this big, loud, like booger bark, you know, I'm looking at bear sign and the dog barks over here. I'm like, great. He tried to make friends with a bear. Right. And uh, 
he comes flying out of there down to me, comes, sits down in front of me, looks up with this absolutely heartbroken look on his face with one quill right here. <laughs> and it wasn't even stuck in the skin. It was in his hair. <laughs> and, and so now if he gets, if, if you, he gets near a porcupine, he'll, he'll look at it and then like jump and run away from it. So he actually acts like a dog who's blinking birds, right? The exactly. One, so the one who's been overtrained and is like, up, up, no bird here, no bird yeah. here. <laughs> Except he's blinking porcupines. Well, Blake, let me know when you find a good setter breeder because we went <laughs> and we might. I mean, as long as we have the same breed now, we might as well, you know, keep the keep the pattern going. Yeah, we. I haven't had uh, any issues with the wire hair vishla female yet, but she she has a similar attitude. Like you look at her the wrong way, and she. Her feelings get hurt so i don't think we'll have an issue with her <laughs> yeah you know because they made that dog out of the the drop and the visual I, and I think it's only been like 60 years or something like that maybe 70 years that breed has been around mm -hmm. i get that same thought too because you you've met tagus he's if he was a different color you'd think he was a phenomenal looking all albeit short we call him joe pesci he <laughs> look he looks like a german wire hair right i mean he is got yeah the hair and the face and the beard and it's strong. And I thought about that. I'm like, I wonder, I wonder if that means he got a little bit more of the, the wire hair ancestor. And I'm in, <laughs> in South Dakota last year with my little Cocker Spaniel and him outside of the little lodge we were staying in. And this place has a lot of, you know, barn cats that hang around. And the two of them were over by this electrical box sniffing and sniffing. And I hear her yipe a little bit and I hear him bark. And there's a cat, and this cat's used to dogs, right? And this cat just goes, gives the hiss and the swat. And the two of them ran away like you spanked them. And I was like, good, good. I don't, I don't need that anymore. I don't need that anymore. So, um, well, I don't know if we want to, I mean, we, we're going we're gonna to be there for Saturday the 14th. And we're going to, anybody who can come to this is going to, can spend the night, bring a tent, bring a whatever. I'm going to be sleeping in my camper. Is there a limit to the camping at all? Or basically is there enough room there around to, uh, so it, yeah, so it's a, it's going to, it's a state campground. Um, so it's not right at the hall or the location that we're going to have it. It's going to be a quick drive. It's still on the Gladwin field trial grounds. Um, oh, okay. but yeah, okay. we're going to, we're going to try to pick, one of those uh there's two campgrounds we're going to try to pick one of them and then you know have all of us try to camp there so it's it's a first come first serve which is kind of unfortunate but i think it's only a couple bucks a night to camp so yeah that's not a big deal or a state park sticker is that does that get you in there yeah i think you, you need the uh yeah the recreation pass or passport or what whatever they call it probably could get it all there though if, if somebody decides to stay on if they weren't even planning yeah yeah so yeah i mean honestly you could come probably friday night too to be honest because i i believe the festivities i guess start at i guess 10 o'clock or so yeah i think gabe said he was going to be set up there friday night didn't he yeah i'm going to be there because i got to get the smoker going in the morning so yeah and then um and are we missing are we missing anything Um, I hate to have not that I can think of. I just want to make sure, like we reiterate. So we go to the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society website. Look under the events yep. page, or go to the Jim Foot chapter of Rough Grouse Society. Yeah, the Facebook page. Facebook page. Okay. Is there is yep. there is there a limit on people right now that you that you've got in your head? No. Um, yeah. I mean, we. We'll probably, yeah, we'll take whoever. I mean, <laughs> we didn't have, we didn't, there's not a cap, I should say. Right. So. At least for the day event, but you, you'd you probably want to yeah. know for, you know, for the, the night, you know, the night meal, if, if maybe somebody would say if they're going to stay or they just want to go and go on to go up on, on to camp or back home or whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, ideally for food, it'd be nice to have everyone register um, a few days in advance for sure. Yeah. I, and so I, would, I know how much pork to buy. <laughs> right. And I would tell people, you know, if there, there's going to be something to eat, but we're not going to be able to run out and find a couple more pork shoulders to start smoking at 
two and yeah. a half. So not gonna <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. But, you know, buns, condiments, some kind of salad will be there or, or something like that. That's what yep. you're talking about, like, you know, uh, coleslaw, potato salad, chips, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah. And I'll, how about now, if people are coming up and we know we know the wave comes up for the opener, even though it's probably not the best time to go grouse hunting, but people are chomping at the bit. If you have your dog, I'm sure you want them on a tie out stake, on a leash. You're, you're not going to be an opportunity to run the dogs in the field or anything like that. No. Um, I think that, and I'm sure the state park probably has a leash law because I, I this, ha this happens at tra training grounds. Somebody gets there and they're like, oh no, my dog's fine. And they just open the door and the dog runs out and he's running up to every other dog. And so I'm just say saying that ahead of time. If you're, if your dog's with you or if you're bringing your dog and it's got to be under control. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Yeah. So it's, yeah, definitely a dog friendly event. Um, yeah, because it's going to be all outdoors. So yeah, but yeah, for sure under under control, and yeah, we don't want to have any. Are you, um, are you unnecessary? Or are you leaving them home with your wife? No, she's coming. We're bringing all three of them, so we'll have the okay. puppy and everything. How about you, Scott? Are you bringing a dog, or you're just coming to? No, I, I think I think the dog is going to stay at home with my wife. I'm heading out, um, kind of middle of the night, Sunday night, Monday morning for Montana. So. Oh wow! Yeah. So, so you're gonna get back home that night and and yeah, get probably I'll, I'll I'll stay through the evening and then drive home and start packing on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, now we got another subject to talk about. You're going to yeah. <laughs> the the season's already opened. I've been seeing pictures on uh, Instagram already. Yeah. Um, is this a return trip or a new trip for you? This is this is a this is a first trip for me. Wow. Um, to to do this, the dog my dog's come along nice. I mean, he's, he's a three-year-old dog. I'm not going to call him a finished grouse dog, right? Uh, but he's come along. He's, he's done nice. Um, and, um, it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's, he's seen a lot of grouse. He's seen a lot of woodcock. It's, it's time for him to see some different birds and some different yeah. type of cover. And uh, so I'm, I'm fully prepared for him because he, he's, he's been on wild grouse predominantly. So right. he's seen, you know, a bird, brace of birds, that kind of thing. And, you know, and they're gone. Right. I'm certain that the first time we're out there in a, a covey of huns or, or sharp tails come up, I'm going to watch my dog, you know, <laughs> bounding across the prairie. Yep. <laughs> and all the, all the, yeah, you could make a dog look finished in the woods. Cause you could say no bird, no bird. Well, that's because nobody can see the bird. The dog's like, I don't even know where to run, but yeah, you'll, uh, I, I got kind of lucky with my my cocker last year. That was her first year of pheasant hunting. And I was flanking a field. It was a, a block drive, like a driven hunt, you know, for a lodge. And these birds were peeling out. And when the hens would come out, I couldn't shoot, obviously. And, sh you know, cockers are supposed to stay, you know, 20, 30 yards. And there she goes off, you know, 300 yards after a pheasant. And the next one, it was only 100. The next one, I just kept saying, no bird, no bird. I think all she was getting was the no. And by the end of the that day of the fields, I kept asking to flank because I was like, wow, I'm actually getting some training in here, you know. But the pointing dog is a different story. I, you know, the, the cockers kind of used to being close anyway. Um, and, you, and you're not going to want to shock it, right? You're, you're, yeah. All you want to do is say you want to come when called, but – Boy, that's going to be, I can't wait to hear how that goes, Scott. <laughs> I, I think it'll, he's got a really good handle on him. And and he's, end of last season, he was picking it up a little bit. And he's shown me a lot this year of, of woe to flush. So oh, that's that wild, great. That wild yeah. flush bird, he's boom, locking right up on when it takes off. So, um, so the idea of not being able to chase a bird is not foreign to him. No, no. Oh, and, and I'm good. actually going out by, I'm just going, he and I are just going out by ourselves. And I'm, wow. I'm taking a lot of this. If I, if I get a couple birds, great. But this to me is going to be a, 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 you know, like a lot of the guys go out in August and do, they train for a week. Right. Um, right. It's kind of what it's, I'm using this for. Totally. And yeah, the, the birds will be the bonus. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're driving by yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the story of my life. All my buddies live around the country in different spots and I never have anybody. Or if I do, I'm going to stay longer and do something else on the way back. Cause I'm retired 
and that person can't come with me because they can only be gone for X amount of time. So road, were you going to be sleeping in the truck or are you going to motel it like a civilized person? No, I, 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 I'm taking two days to get out. I'm, I'm staying uh, just inside North Dakota the first day. So like 14 and a half hour drive the first day. And I, I, I did uh, Airbnbs. Yeah. Yeah. And actually they ended up being cheaper than hotels would be. And mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be, you know, quieter. And I, I just worry about hotels and, you know, dragging guns and everything in and out of I hotels. Know. You, you always feel like, well, nothing's ever happened. And then you're like, well, I'm going to carry the gun in anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you got to leave. Sometimes you got to leave the dog in the truck and then you're like, ah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And then Blake, when are you heading out West? Uh, we leave uh, oh, so 21st. Same week. Right. Same yeah. Week. And we're, we're going to be there probably 14 days or so, or maybe like, 13 12 or 13 days of hunting so so next year if scott's dog chases sharp tails he's going to be following us to north dakota so he's got a shorter drive i bet yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be exactly he'll be welcome there's there's plenty of places to hunt out there um you so you've been doing some scouting then scott for places to go yeah yeah i've been doing that and you know been kind of montana it's almost i mean there's so much so many options between the, with the block management land and then they've got that, uh, the upland bird program thing. And then there's just, you know, wildlife uh, management areas. And yeah, yeah there's a ton you, of, you'll have plenty of places a ton, to walk. A ton of land, um, managed to find, um, I've been emailing back and forth. I have my own personal, uh, uh, question person at, uh, Montana fish and wildlife. Uh, she answered my email, the first dumb questions that I sent. And I said, is it okay if I just email you back instead of going through the website? So, so you made a I friend. Said, <laughs> yeah, I bought I bought my licenses online last night. And it's a little bit confusing because, you know, you've got the Upland Bird license and then you've got the basic thing and the, yeah. the conservation permit or whatever that, that you have to do out there. And I said, oh, I think this looks right. So I, I ran it by her this morning. I said, is this is this everything? Am I forgetting anything? <laughs> Oh, she's going to have a, your name up on there and say, if this guy knocks on the door, tell him I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then of course I've, I've got, of course I know enough people that have been out there that, you know, everybody's, everybody's giving you their, their, their two cents worth and their, yeah. their pointers and stuff. Well, that'll be exciting. I, I almost wish the event was after that so I could hear how your first trip to Montana went. Mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll, we'll talk it up just like we do at every bird camp on, on Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. The, absolutely you'll be we'll all be asking you medical questions and you'll be going like so where did where did you go on your way where did you stop where was it? Send me a yeah, two, two guys i hunt with are actually leaving tomorrow uh, okay. to go out the same part of montana and i said okay well drop me some pens when you're done yeah there you go there you go all right so let's reiterate one last time blake take it away what's let's put the plug out there one more time yep so the event is september 14th um, at the Gladwin field trial area. So it's just gonna be a fun day of talking and learning about grouse hunting and just getting prepped for the season. Um, and yeah, it starts at 10 o'clock. It's, uh, 50 bucks per person to show up. Um, and that that's including, we're going to have some prizes, drawings. Um, I believe, uh, a friend of ours, Matt Frank from Osprey, I think he donated a gun. Um, okay. so we're going to have, so some decent, decent, uh, auction or not auction, sorry, but like raffle items and yeah prizes. So it should be a fun day and that, so yeah. And that's including lunch and dinner. So that'll be provided. So, you know, and camping that, and trivia <laughs> and trivia. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to have a trivia game set up. I, I don't know how we're going to do this, but it's all going to depend on how many people are there, whether we have teams or individuals or whatever. And, uh, and I'll bring the recording equipment, and uh, we're going to have some fun. Uh, it's yeah. like you said, it's the kickoff to hunting season. Why? Why not? And yeah, the kickoff um, and the uh, and celebrating the the ten year anniversary of AWS and uh, and the gems. So yeah, yeah. and I, we did forget one person that's presenting. Uh, Michael Mapes is going to be there. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Change. How could we forget him? Yeah. <laughs> so will, will he be bringing some dog samples with him? I'm sure he, he might be. <laughs> yeah he, he can. yeah i can i can run through the i can run through the roster real quick just yeah do that so everybody knows yeah, like yeah so we've got del whitman for patterning and firearm care uh bruce barlow he's going to be doing the woodcock and grouse habitat walk so the interactive walk through the 
uh, through the grounds. Um, and then Scott's going to be talking about field and truck first aid kits and tick management. Uh, and Michael Mapes is going to be there with second chance bird dogs. Um, and then there's, I think uh, Gabe Stone is going to be chatting about just what's going on in Michigan right now with yeah. um, Rough Grouse Society and our projects. Um, and then Chad Donahue, he's going to be the taxidermist that we've got. He's also a very active uh, RGS member uh, in a different chapter. And then Joe Swanky is going to be there for the Upland cooking demonstration. Sweet. Well, so. I can tell you, I'm looking forward to it. My wife, she said, what are you doing today? I said, oh, we're doing the thing for, you know, what I got to do on the 14th. And she goes, you didn't tell me. And I looked right, <laughs> I, four, I got a four month calendar that I finally started. In my whole life, I went by a bad memory, right? And that's no place to be when you own a construction company. And since I started the podcast, I have a four month planner up here with, you know, guests, times, trips. And I just pointed at the calendar and she goes, oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, so <laughs> I will be there with bells on. I can't wait to say hi to everybody. Can't wait to meet you in person, uh, Scott. And uh, I hope I encourage everybody to come. I encourage everybody to everybody that can to camp over because everyone knows that it gets better with beer. That's right. Or hey, bourbon. Everybody, everybody, think of your questions for me. Yeah. And if I don't know an answer, I'll, I'll make something up. Sounds good. Right. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't have possibly <laughs> went to every class in vet school. You had to skip a couple. <laughs> Well, I, I skipped more than a couple. I, I, I had some good <laughs> classmates that I could borrow note sets from. And, and I spent most of the time during the day fishing and hunting. <laughs> Pick your vet school based on hunting and fishing opportunities is what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I can't wait to see both of you. And I hope a lot of listeners show up. And I, I know it's a, a, a far drive for a few, but there's plenty of Michigan listeners that'll be like, hey, let's do it. So we're going to have some fun, all in the name of conservation and Rough Grouse Society, the American Woodcock Society, and uh, our brotherhood of hunters and fishermen and conservationists and habitat. Oh, you know, I'm getting all schmaltzy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I should figure out a way to end that cleaner, but uh, it's all right. I, I don't edit because that's not me. I'm going to stop this.